Today, or this evening, I will talk about the topic, leaving a legacy. Leaving a legacy. It's such an important topic. You know, brothers and sisters, let us remind ourselves about something. And that is, after we die, the majority of people will forget that we even existed by the third generation. How many of you remember your great-grandparents? I want you to think about that for a minute. It is commonly known, and many studies have already been done on this, that the average time for people to forget that you even existed after you die is by the third generation. And all you have to do is to see if you can remember your great-grandparents or your great-great-grandparents. It's as if they never existed in this world. Isn't that right? So by the time you and I die, we'll be soon forgotten. Completely. This is a fact that everybody knows. So what is your value? Who are you in this world? <laughs> all this effort and all this work that we do, all this tiredness that we go through, the sacrifices, the tears and the sweat, seem all to be in vain. And the only thing left is for us to hold on to something that gives us some kind of hope or purpose. But the truth is, once we die, soon we are forgotten. By people, that is. Our children will soon lose memory of us, and then their children, and the children who come after them. Not only that, there is a study that a friend of mine gave to me, and I found it very interesting. It says that in according to a widely quoted longitudinal study of 3,250 families conducted over 25 years by U.S. wealth consultancy, the Williams Group, in 2002, they said about 70% of a family's wealth is squandered by the second generation. And by the third generation, it's 90% squandered. All that wealth that you accumulated by the third generation <laughs> perishes and it's spent and gone. And then you think to yourself, I lived all my life accumulating this wealth for my children, for my children's children, and the generations to come. And majority of people by the third generation have already spent all that money. And they give reasons. There are many theories. The children kind of remember your efforts, but not as much because they didn't work as hard for it. Then their children they forget, they don't even know how much work has been put into it and they just enjoy that luxury. And when you haven't worked hard for something, you spend it very quick. By the fourth generation, forget it. It's gone. Your wealth is perished. So I wonder why people work for wealth. Now, of course, we do need wealth. And wealth is a means of many benefits for us in life. And a Muslim should not look at wealth as something that they should not have. Rather, you should have wealth, and you should work for wealth, money and things like that, because they save you from begging other people. They save you from needing other people. They make you stronger and a benefit to other people. Wealth is strength. It is power. However, I'm not talking about that. We're talking about people who live their life for two things, solely and only confined to worldly gain and don't believe or even care or think that there is a life after death, that there is a hereafter. Don't think about why we are here, where we came from and where we're going. Just like an animal kingdom. We're just here as the products of the uh, biodiversity and the uh, chemical 
reactions that happened in the world and haphazardly and suddenly you and I are here and we just live and die like uh, just any other object in life that has no other meaning or purpose. And we just create purposes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about these types of people. So if you make money your sole purpose to gain it and, that, and to accumulate it, then it will be lost by the third generation. And there it goes. And if you want to be remembered for a glory or an achievement that you've done, by the third or fourth generation you are forgotten. Even your own family doesn't know you existed. In the past, people who didn't believe in Allah, didn't believe in their messengers and prophets, when they used to fight in wars, they fought for one thing, the most chivalrous among them fought for glory. Glory to have statues built of them and to be remembered in the books to come. And they say, this is how we live on. But this is just a fallacy and, and, and just a way to cover up their emptiness. My dear brothers and sisters, so what is the solution? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us in the Quran, in Surah Yasin, chapter 36, verse 12, A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim. إِنَّا نَحْنُ نُحْيِي الْمَوْتَى وَنَكْتُبُ مَا قَدَّمُوا وَآثَارَهُمْ وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْصَيْنَاهُ فِي إِمَامٍ مُبِينٍ Allah says, we shall surely raise the dead to life. And we record what they did. And the traces of their deeds that they have left behind. We have encompassed that all in a clear book. Let's analyze the verse first and then we'll go on insha'Allah with the explanations. This particular verse in the Quran, which is in Surah Yasin, tells us about three things for us to remember. The first thing to remember is this. Number one, whatever a person does, in this life, whether it's good or bad, is entered into a divine register. It is all recorded and it stays there. And it will be reproduced on the day of judgment. That's the first thing. The second thing we learn from this verse is the following. That all of a person's impressions and marks on the objects of this environment even on his own body, everything he did in this life leaves a mark and an impression. Even on your body. All of your actions, your intentions, your goals and your doings, good and bad, will be brought to life one day as you watch them and you must answer to them. That's the second thing we learn. We are going to answer to everything. Everything that is done has an impression in life. Our goals, our intentions. And the third thing that Allah tells us in this verse, whatever influences, whatever, what? Influences how you affected other people. Whatever influences, this is the modern age of influencers. So, whatever influences you have left behind of your good and bad actions on the future generations, on your society, on mankind as a whole, will go in being recorded in your account as far as they reach. And as long as they remain active, and operative, as long as people act upon what you influenced people on before you died and after you died and you left it behind. The full record of the good and bad training given by you to your children, the good and evil that you have spread in society and its impact on people as a whole will go on being maintained till the time that it goes on producing good or evil results in this world. Man, that, that verse is really deep to me. I don't know if you thought about it that deeply. Allah is telling you, not only 
Are your actions which you do or did in this world are recorded and you'll be accountable, you and I be accountable for them? But even the influences we left behind after we're dead, we are dead and we are no longer doing anything yet. If we have left something behind of good or evil and it's affecting people in that way, it's influencing people and they're still acting on it, I'm still going to either get its reward or cop it. I'm going to still suffer or get rewarded for it even after I'm long gone and dead. These are the things I left behind. In other words, the legacy that you leave behind, good or bad, will also come back to you. So death is not even the end. Allah tells us even what you left behind, because that's your work. The question now is, what kind of a legacy do you want to leave behind that will count for you ongoing after you die? We live in an age right now with social media. It, nearly every person in the world is on it. Old, young, all types. And nearly every single person in this world in the past at least 10 years to 20 years has recorded or written or posted something on social media somewhere. And someone has read it or watched it or copied it or acted upon it or listened to it from nearly every single person in this world. We've never had such a thing in the history of this world where every individual has an influence on large numbers of people. You'll be sitting in your bed, in your lounge. You could be a nobody. You could be what they call an NPC. Non-player character. And you will be influencing thousands of people and nobody knows you. Or they might know you. Or you might have another name. And you're just this dark person living in this dark room behind a screen and these seriously wicked headphones with a wicked chair and you're influencing thousands of hundreds of thousands millions of people that is going to be your legacy after you die what do you want to leave what do you want to influence what do you want to be remembered by listen to this hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and I'll just summarize, it's reported by Muslim, number 1017 and a tirmidhi number 2675. It's a long hadith, but I'll just summarize it and speak the end of it, what the Prophet ﷺ said. So there was an incident where a group of tribes from Mudar at the time of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, they were a very respectable tribe and they came to Medina to the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. And they were friends with the Muslims and some of them had converted to Islam. And when the Prophet ﷺ saw them, he saw them in a very destitute state. They were shrubby, they were poor. It looked like they hadn't eaten, they haven't got food in their land. They're poor. And he, got very, he felt very sorry for them. So he stood up and he called Bilal to make the adhan. And all the Muslims came along. Whenever the adhan is called, the Muslims came. It was outside of prayer. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, gave them a short khutbah and recited some verses. And then he said to them, if any of you can donate anything, even if it is one coin, a silver coin, uh, a bit of wheat, a handful of barley, a piece of clothing, anyone, even a piece of date, anyone to help these people. As soon as he said that, one man got up and beat everyone else and came with a bag of coins which he could barely hold in his hand, and he threw it to the Prophet ﷺ to give to the poor. Then when the other companions saw him, they rushed and they started racing each other, each one bringing bags upon bags, and this person carrying stuff on his shoulder from home, and bringing all this wealth to donate to these destitute people. The Prophet ﷺ's face was radiant, and then he stood up and he said the following words, Whoever starts a good thing and is followed by others, will have his own reward and a reward equal to that of those who follow him. Without it detracting or decreasing from their reward in any way, 
Meaning that if you do a good deed and you influence others to follow you and copy you by being motivated by you to also do this good deed, then you will have your reward for doing your part and for every person who does it after you because of you, you will also get a copy of their reward of what they do because you influenced it and started a chain reaction. And it will keep going until the end of time, until the people stop and it no longer exists. You will enter your grave if you had left it behind. And if people are still copying you because of your influence, they might have forgotten your name. Number of people probably won't know who you are anymore. That's not important anymore. Your name and who you are is not important for a Muslim anymore. But it is the actions which you leave behind and people continue them. Because who is the one that knows you? Who really matters to know you anyway? Is it people? Is it family? They're all going to forget you. And at the end of the day, everybody moves on and they live their lives. But who is the one that really matters that you want to remember you and record you and reward you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, Anni la udi'u amala amilim minkum in dhakarin aw untha. Tell them, O Messenger of God, that I will never lose a single good deed of any of you, whether you are male or female. And Allah says in Surah Al Zumar, in Surah Al Muzammil, and whatever you put forth, even if it's a little bit, for yourselves, for the sake of Allah, you will find its reward with Allah. He is the best one to reward you. And when he rewards, he rewards abundantly. So seek forgiveness from your Lord for whatever's left of your sins. Allah is always forgiving, most merciful as well. So no good deed is lost. If you start a good trend that is pleasing to Allah within the Islamic boundaries, then you will have the reward of yourself and everyone else as an investment. The hadith goes on. But whoever starts a bad thing, now the opposite. But whoever starts a bad thing that is displeasing to Allah, and is followed by others, will bear the burden of his own sin and a burden equal to that of those who follow him without it detracting or decreasing from their burden in any way. So people who start and influence others on social media, for example, and they start a bad trend, a haram trend, a sinful trend, a detested trend, an immodest trend, whether in looks or listening or words or writing, and people carry that on and, for example, share it and post it on and repost, and it's not good, it's not pleasing to Allah, then you will have the sin of doing it first and everybody who shared it and reposted it. SubhanAllah. That's tough. Of course, a person can repent and can retract their bad deed. Allah is forgiving most merciful. That's what he told us. Meaning that if you do bad deeds and people copy them, that's why Allah says, Allah, seek Allah's forgiveness, meaning Allah can forgive all sins. Retract what you posted, retract what you did, try to fix as much as you can, and start to replace what you did wrong with something better for the rest of your life. Inshallah, it will cover you. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa also said the hadith in Sahih Muslim, whoever guides to something good, is like the one who does it. You merely point in a particular direction of goodness. Let's say somebody uh, says to you, do you know anybody who is in need around here? I have a bit of money, I want to help them, or I have a bit of service that I would love to help them. And you know this person's sincere, and you merely give a name or you point in a direction. Or somebody wants help, and you point and you help them in a direction, and they achieve it or don't achieve it you will still get the reward of guiding them and pointing. Did you know that? Something as simple as that. When you reflect upon these words, brothers and sisters, we find that we all strive for some sort of success. 
And most of us believe that, um, that it has to do with climbing the career ladder, for example, or becoming a blue chip CEO, or uh, you know, owning a business and paying off our house, becoming millionaires, and so on. Or just having just enough to live a comfortable life, If we are indeed remembered, we are not going to be remembered for our own personal achievements, brothers and sisters. We're going to be remembered for what we left behind that benefit other people. The morals, the ethics, the work, the services that benefit other people for the sake of Allah. And that's what really matters. And that's what really counts for us, insha'Allah ta'ala. There was a woman, the hadith is in Bukhari somewhat, and in uh, Tirmidhi and Abu Dawood, her name was called, we don't know exact name, it was probably Ummu Mihjan. Some say it was probably a young boy as well named Mihjan. And he, she wasn't known other than that name. Her lineage wasn't known. Nobody knew who she was. Because for a Muslim, it doesn't matter what your, what your name is and what color or race you belong to. It is based on your value of your righteousness and your good work and your benefit to others and your honesty and your integrity and your uh, values, your morals, all of that. So this woman used to simply clean the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's all she could do. That's all she, she was able to do. And one day she passed away in the night. The Prophet ﷺ had told them that if anybody passes away in the community, don't bury them until you tell me. Tell me about it. Or maybe he just said, let me know, without the word, don't bury them until you tell me. Let me know. So this lady passed away, and they went to the Prophet ﷺ and found him asleep. And they didn't want to disturb him, out of love for him. So they went and buried her in the night. And in the morning, Rasul ﷺ in Fajr, he noticed that the woman wasn't there. She wasn't picking up or cleaning before or after. So he immediately asked about her. Where is she? They said, Ya Rasulullah, she passed away last night and we buried her. He said, didn't I tell you to tell me? Didn't I say tell me? Show me. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, we didn't want to disturb you out of love for you and respect. You were asleep. He said, show me her grave. So he went there and he prayed for her, the Salat al-Janazah and made dua for her. And he said, my dua benefits the people of the graves. The point of this hadith and this incident is that her name is not important. Her lineage is not important. What is important is her actions and work that she left behind that she did for the sake of Allah. And it's something very small, yet to Allah it's very big. Very big. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لا تحقرن من المعروف شيء. Don't take for granted even the smallest of good deeds. ولا أن تلقى أخاك بوجه طلق. Even if you were to meet your brother with a delightful face, a cheerful, welcoming face, even that is an act of goodness and charity. Rasul صلى الله عليه وسلم also told us that even if moving an obstacle off a pathway or a place or a thing that you know people could be harmed by. The other day I saw a brother, he was on Hume Highway, and another man was in his car. He drove off with his shoes on the car, on the roof. He forgot them on the roof. As he was driving off, the shoes fell on the highway, and cars were coming and going. And this brother, he went, waited for the cars. It was a very busy road. Went outside, moves those shoes onto the footpath. I said, why? He said, well, in case some car you know, um, goes over it and because there's strong shoes, it might cause an accident or harm someone. So I moved it. Or a car may be swerving away from it or something like that. The point is whether it was going to happen or not, whether it was that dangerous or not, the brother's intentions was what matters. And the action for the sake of Allah. He said, I heard a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ that even moving an obstacle off the road is an act of charity. Do you think Allah will not count that for him? Of course he will count that for him. And he will multiply it, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Innamal a'malu bin niyat, actions are by intentions. 
But my dear brothers and sisters, in order to leave a good legacy behind and a good work, we have to be careful on condition. If a person does their work and their good deed solely for worldly gain and no hereafter gain, the hereafter is not even in their mind. Or number two, they do it solely to show off and so that people can praise them for their ego, for their popularity, for their fame, and purely only for money. And that's it. No sign of any intention for Allah or the hereafter then those actions, brothers and sisters, if they are acts of worship, such as salat, then it's, it's a problem. It's, it's shirk. It's making partners with Allah. How can you pray when you're supposed to be doing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a person does it in order to please people? If that's the intention, that salat is in vain and it is a major sin and shirk. If it is a non-worship act, such as worldly acts, it's, you can do it for the, you can show it off, but you, if it does it's not for the sake of Allah, there is no legacy left that will benefit you in the hereafter. There's no rewards for you except what you gained in the worldly reward. And for example, if a person shows off their car, the car is not an act of worship, and they show it off to please people, and that's all the only reason why, and they do it with that intention. We cannot judge people's intention, by the way, brothers and sisters. I can't look at somebody and say, look at this guy with his rims and shiny car. He's trying to impress people. That's haram of me to judge that person's heart. Don't ever do that, brothers and sisters, because now you've fallen into a problem, and that is you are judging the unseen. And who is the only one who knows the unseen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't ever judge a person's heart. However, I'm talking to you as an individual. If you yourself, you, every person knows himself. If I do that, if I buy that thing, if I drive that thing, if I dress in that way, if I say that thing, if I post that thing solely and purely because I want to impress people and my life is based on impressing people, then that's all I'm going to get. I have no other reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, قُلْ هَلْ نُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِالْأَخْسَرِينَ أَعْمَالًا الَّذِينَ ضَلَّ سَعْيُهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَهُمْ يَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ يُحْسِنُونَ صُنْعًا أولئك الذين كفروا بآيات ربهم ولقائه فحبطت أعمالهم فلا نقيم لهم يوم القيامة وزنا Chapter 18 verse 105 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Say, O Muhammad, shall we tell you who will be the greatest losers in respect of their works? It will be those whose effort went astray in the life of the world and who believe nevertheless that they are doing good. They thought they're doing good, but they went astray with their work. Those are the ones who refuse to believe in the revelations of their Lord and that they are bound to meet him. Hence, all their deeds have come to naught. They are worthless, and we shall assign no weight to them on the day of resurrection. So there are two types of people. Those who don't believe in the hereafter and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and those who do believe in the hereafter and Allah, but their actions were done solely and only for anything other than Allah, other than the hereafter, other than goodness, and only for their own selfish selves, and only so that they can receive only the worldly benefit and nothing else. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks here about acts of worship and acts of goodness that are meant to be pleasing to Allah. Riyah, showing it off. Now, some people may ask, what if I do an act of goodness and I get some money for it, such as I teach Quran or I teach Islam or I give da'wah or I give a khutbah or I'm an imam of a masjid or I share some material online and I prepare them for Islamic purposes to teach people. The answer to that, brothers and sisters, is that the majority of the scholars say this is permissible. Because of the hadith, which is in Bukhari, where the Prophet Sallallahu said to his companion, one of the companions who had done a service for someone who was sick, and he did a ruqya, so he read some Qur'an for them, and they gave him uh, some wealth, and a reward, or some payment. And they said, you took a payment for reciting the Qur'an. And when they went to the Prophet Sallallahu they said, he did this, Ya Rasulullah, and he said, the best type of reward to receive for is the Qur'an. 
the best type of reward to receive for is the Qur'an. The hadith is in Bukhari. And I think I can actually bring it up because some people will have a problem with that, wouldn't they? You've got uh, keyboard warriors. I'm sorry, there, there are a lot of keyboard warriors. They just write without thinking. The hadith is in Bukhari, number 5405. ma <laughs> One of the biggest rights of receiving reward for is the Qur'an. The only thing that the scholars said not to do is a person who sits in front of people and recites and says, now pay me. That's not allowed in Islam. Or a person who goes to pray and says, pay me for my prayer. That, that's obviously shirk and haram. But if a person puts effort to teach people and they prepare material and they take their time off, and for some people this is the only thing they do, and they have to leave their worldly work, then how are they going to survive? How do they pay for their rent? How do they pay for their bills? How do they pay for their family to feed them, brothers and sisters? So there are scholars and ulama who we need to pay for to help in order to help the community. And this is considered a sadaqah, insha'Allah, from the community. Uh, so those who say, oh, they can't, and they call the kuffar and mushrikeen, really, honestly, I advise you to study Islam well and ask the scholars properly, and don't just throw words around. Um, everything we are judged for. Even when you write stuff on social media, whether a person's jealous or they're trying to attack a person or they're trying to judge a person, Allah's going to ask you about that. So, brothers and sisters, let's move on. Uh, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the hadith is in Sahih Muslim, when a man dies, his deeds come to an end except for three things. And this is where I'll end my talk, inshallah, with these three things and explain them a little bit. Sadaqa jariya, a ceaseless charity. When a person dies, no more actions can continue for you. You can't pray anymore. You can't fast anymore. You can't go to hajj anymore. You can't do good deeds. You can't give charity. Isn't that correct? So that means your actions become to an end. No more rewards and no more sins. Unless you left a bad legacy behind. He said, except for three things, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number one, sadaqa jariya, an ongoing charity or a ceaseless char charity that you left behind that continues for people to benefit from that charity. Or, number two, a knowledge which is beneficial. You left a piece of knowledge that people benefit from, that continues for people that they continue to benefit from. Number three, or a righteous descendant, a child and a grandchild and a great-grandchild. All your descendants till the end of time, so long as... What? He says, a righteous descendant who prays for you, for the deceased, makes dua for you, makes istighfar for you. It doesn't matter how far they go in their generations. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim and also in Riyadh al-Salihin, number 1383. And another hadith from Prophet wasallam, which is also in Ibn Majah and authenticated by Imam al-Albani, he said, among the acts and good deeds that will reach a believer after his death are... Knowledge which he learned and then spread. Good knowledge. A righteous son or, in other words, daughter, a child, because in Arabic you can apply it to both genders. A righteous child whom he leaves behind or she leaves behind. A copy of the Qur'an that he leaves as a legacy. It doesn't have to be literally a copy like those ones you see there. It could be online, of course. It could be memorized and taught. A mosque that he built. And it doesn't have to be the entire mosque. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, another hadith says, even if it were a brick that you contributed to, or a piece of cement, labina, or tina, a rock, or a stone, or a piece of pillar, or anything of the masjid which contributed to it, inshallah, you would have been considered one of those who built that masjid. Uh, a house that he built for wayfarers, so like a refuge home, uh, homes for destitute, homes for uh, people who are homeless, homes for people who have had a bad, probably separated in their marriage, for example, uh, a single mother, for example, or a single father who does not have any income, and you make a shelter for them, these types of things. And all of whatever goes under that, a house or a shelter built for wayfarers or people who are in need, a canal that they dug. So let's say people try and build a road, 
and you took part in it for the sake of Allah as a charity, then even something like that, so paving ways for people, building, constructing something that served people, or a charity that he gave during his lifetime when he was in good health. Why? Because when you're in bad health, you can need that money to use for yourself. So when you're in good health and you gave it, what does it mean? It means that this person has true reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't think, what if I one day go into bad health? What if this happens to me? So he holds on to his money. So that's why he said, in good health, meaning that you have tawakkul. You're not thinking about tomorrow, a charity event comes, people are in need, your brothers in Palestine are in need, your brothers in Afghanistan, your brothers in China, your brothers in there, your brothers in there, your brothers and sisters everywhere around the world. And you give a charity and you don't think, man, if I gave this, maybe next year I'll be sick and end up and I'll probably need it. You don't know that. That's why he said, those who are in good health are given charity. And so on. He said, these deeds will reach him after his death. One man said, Ya Rasulullah, what kind of charity the minimal that I can receive? He said, any kind of charity. في كل كبد رطب صدقة. He said, in every creature that lives and breathes. In other words, if it benefits from your charity, it is a charity. So for example, a person planted a tree in the middle of the desert and you've got scorpions and snakes and other little creatures, no humans there. They benefit from that tree in some way or whatever other animals or insects. He said, everything that, live, that lives and breathes and moves, you have a sadaqah for it, subhanAllah. And there's a hadith from Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which forbids the killing of ants, for example, and the bee, because the bee is in the Quran, the ants are in the Quran in, in, in a way that is praiseworthy. To avoid killing them is a sadaqah, subhanAllah. Can you imagine that? Or that man or that woman who did a very bad deed, the hadith in Bukhari where they gave a dog water to drink, hoping that Allah will forgive them, and Allah forgave them because of it. So don't ever take for granted even these little things. Rasul therefore said ongoing charity. Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, the third Khalifa, you know his story, how wealthy he was. And in fact, when I talk about wealth, I say wealth is power, so long as you use it in a good way. So long as you look at wealth, you know the article I read to you before that the next generation after you, if you leave wealth behind, 70% of them would have spent that money that you left behind. And in the third generation, 90% of, uh, of your wealth would have gone. In the article, they say something very interesting. They also say that there are some families who maintain the assets and they keep going on and on. How do they do that? They say their parents have trained their children of a mindset. The mindset is money is not theirs. It is as if they're custodians over the money. Like it is a trust that they have to maintain and care for. You see, that's different to being selfish. And it's very interesting because in Islam, it teaches us that all the wealth and whatever we have are all called blessings that we are entrusted with. Allah doesn't give you your wealth for you only. He gives you your wealth, you are entrusted with it. So the more you have, don't sit there thinking, oh, if a person has a lot of money, it means God must love them. God is blessing them uh, favorably. No, Allah is testing them. It's a blessing and a test. If you use it in the right way, it's a blessing. If you use it in the wrong way and let it affect your heart, it is a test and a punishment and will punish you in the hereafter. And poverty doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa hates that person or is punishing them. Don't ever think that. Many prophets were poor in, in wealth. Many sahabas were poor in wealth. But they still strived and worked. They didn't just sit there saying, that's it. No. They're all a test. And seven of the ten who were promised paradise, you know, Ashram Mubasharun, the ten companions mentioned in one hadith promised paradise, seven of them, seven out of ten, were extremely wealthy. Extremely wealthy, very rich with money. They say, some historians and experts, they, analysts, they say that Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu was one of the most wealthiest companions. They say they estimated his wealth in today's currency, in American dollars, to be. I forgot the figure, but they were in the billions, like the hundreds of billions, his wealth, in today's currency. But he used it for the sake of the deen, for Islam, for the Muslims, for the community, for the benefit, radiallahu anhu. So brothers and sisters, all of that. Uthman ibn Affan was one of those. He bought a well called the well of um, Ruma. Ruma was a Jewish man who lived... Uh, close to Medina and he had a well and the Muslims were needed water and they offered him to buy it and he his price was very high and Uthman was the only one who could afford it and he bought it 
and donated it as an ongoing charity for the Muslims. Subhanallah, the well of Uthman is still active till today and it is still a waqaf in Saudi Arabia, near Medina, and it's still used for the poor people and the hujjaj who go there, the pilgrims who are poor and need a shelter, they use the profit from that well and whatever is produced and they've got palm trees grown and they've invested it all from Uthman radiallahu anhu and all of its rewards for free. All of its rewards go back to who? To Uthman radiallahu anhu. 1,000, nearly 1,400 years later. That is called an ongoing charity. Something so small like that that you leave. Well, it's big to him, but for you guys, anything, anything that comes to be creative and leave something behind that can benefit other people. So that's the charity. Rasul then said beneficial knowledge. Some people tell me beneficial knowledge is only sharia knowledge, only religious knowledge. Wrong. Wrong. Muslims don't just need salat, zakat, saum, hajj, wudu, what breaks your wudu, uh, uh, you know, uh, all the acts of worship. No. That's one aspect of benefit for the people. The other aspect is also services for the people that benefit them in their livelihood. For example, uh, services that help people in their lives, academic knowledge, and all fields of science, medicine, astronomy, maths and engineering, agriculture, the arts. There are great scholars of the past such as Abu Bakr al-Razi, uh, Ibn al-Nafis, uh, Ibn al-Haytham, Khawarizmi, Abbas ibn Farnaz, uh, Maryam, Al Astrolobi, who invented the calculations of astrolobes, they call it. Um, uh, uh, Khawarizmi, who, who, whose mathematical calculations called algorithms were named after Ibn, uh, um, uh, Ibn al Jabr, uh, who, who, who was where the name algebra was named after, and so on. These are all benefits, but they did it for the sake of Allah and they earned from it, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards them for it, for their intention. Innam al A'mal bin Niyat, actions are just by intentions. Uh, beneficial knowledge just as an academy that you left behind, a school, a Quran school, a weekend school, a training and development institute, even self-defense, life skills, survival skills, a book, a manual, an article, all of these inshallah, so long as your intention is right, you earn a bit of money for it and you do it because it is beneficial for the sake of Allah, you could have chosen a haram knowledge to leave behind and you could have chosen a halal knowledge to leave behind. You chose the halal, you chose the one that pleases Allah and benefits the people and you earned money from it, then alhamdulillah you will also get rewarded as a legacy left behind. Of course if you did it for free and you were able to do it, the reward is even greater. So brothers and sisters, that's the mindset that Rasul taught us. Beneficial knowledge, anything that benefit people so long as it's halal and not haram. Number three, the last one, a righteous child to supplicate for him. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us the hadith is in Musnad Ahmad 10611. He said, Verily Allah Almighty will raise the status of his righteous servants in paradise. And they will say, O Lord, where did I get this all from? Meaning my deeds were all, all over. I don't have anything else to receive these palaces and all this extra. And Allah will say, this is your child seeking forgiveness for you after you passed away. Your, your rank rises because your child makes dua for you. So that means you've got to teach your child and train your child and get them ready to be righteous. Uh, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also said in Al-Hakim and Al-Bani, as authentic as hadith in his Sahih Targhib, he said, whoever reads the Qur'an, learns it and acts in accordance with it, on the day of resurrection, his parents will be given a crown to wear whose light will be like the light of the sun. And his parents will be given garments which, for, which far surpass everything that is found in the world. They will say, why have we been given this to wear? And it will be said to them, because your child learnt the Qur'an. The, one of the, some of the best ways that parents can teach their children to be a benefit for them after their death. Number one, everybody can do this. I want you to remember it. Role modeling. Role modeling your behavior in front of your children is by far the best education and influence you will have on your child to remember. What kind of a role model are you? How do you as a father treat his mother or her mother? How are you as a mother, you treat their father? How do you treat your parents in front of your children if they have grandparents? How do you show your children about how you deal with issues in your families and relatives. What are you teaching them 
connecting or cutting off. I know that some of them are very harmful, but how do you show the role modeling in how to deal with these conflicts? Do you erupt? Do you become immoral? What do you do? How do you role model in front of your children, for example, the salat? I'll give you a little tip. If you want your children to start praying, among the first things you've got to do is, as soon as salat arrives, make it a habit that you stop everything. You stop everything. Whatever you're doing, you're on your phone, you're reciting Quran, you're, whatever you're doing, make it a habit. It doesn't matter if it's eight out of ten times, because sometimes you can't. Stop it in front of your children and let them see that the majority of the time you stop as soon as the salat comes and you get up and make salat. If you're a father and you go to the masjid or you pray at home or you're a mother or you're a brother or you're a sister, it doesn't matter who you are. And I say pray prayers in the, in the house if you've got children every now and then and invite your children to pray with you. They will know that prayer is very important. That's one of the tactics. Another thing you can do is words of dhikr. Whenever you leave your house, enter your car, um, come back home, go to sleep, wake up, make sure your dhikr is said out loud if your children are still small. Say it loudly and, and encourage them to say it with you, such as when you get in the car. Subhanalladhi sakhara lana hadha wa ma kunna lahu And your children continue. Mukrinin. Okay. Wa inna ila rabbina And they say, lamun qalibun. Even if they say it wrong. When I first taught my little daughter, she was about two years old, she used to say, bababliboom. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. That's beautiful. As they get older, you instill that. Why don't you make dua in the morning as you're taking them to school? Say, today we're going to make dua for special people. Who do you want to choose? So and so. Let's make dua. All these beautiful things, brothers and sisters, you're teaching them role modeling. Isn't that better than road rage? Isn't that better than far out, it's all your fault. I told you to wake up and it's because you didn't wear your clothes and your uniform on time. God, you make me sick. That's what parents do. I hear them all they're saying that. And they say, far out, you're always shouting at me every day. Get to school and we as teachers, we come and say, what's wrong, darling? What's going on? What's happened? It's a little kid, a uh, student. You okay? It's just my parents, you know, just had a fight with my brother and sister. Make the morning, wake up a bit earlier and make it a little bit more time for this. Um, Teaching them to say Bismillah before they eat. Everybody does that. If they continue to do that and teach their children, that's an ongoing legacy for you. Being involved in their interests and their activities. Ask, what are their activities? Don't put it down. Don't say, why are you wasting your time reading a fantasy book about a dragon that flies to planet Zorro? <laughs> Sit down with her. Sit down with him, say, let's read it together and let's see what we're learning over here. Why don't you become a teacher? You see a little daughter, a little son looking on something to watch, cartoon thing. Sit with them and say, what's happening over here? And be a teacher for them as they watch it. It works. And you can guide them, inshallah. So be involved in their interests and watch how much connection you will have with them. So... Take that advantage to teach them morals, ethics, and so on. Righteous company. Take them with you to the mosque every now and then. Of course, if you know that they're going to run amok in, in the masjid and uh, you, know, you know your child's like that, maybe bring them in times when you know there's going to be less harm. And as they get older, inshallah, bring them to the masjid. Fathers, mothers, boys and girls. Even if it's outside of Salat, the idea is to bring them and let them see the environment and the people and what their, what their identity and community is. Try to visit people who have good character. Make some friends who you visit every now and then and take your children with them. Um, even if they don't want to go, try. It's really good. I remember when I was a child, I had righteous people come to our house. You know, I got used to the hijab from a very young age. I got used to men with beards all the time and and different clothings and Qur'an and always talking. I, I learned so much. I'll tell you a little story. You want to hear a little story? I was about six, five years old. My father told me. I was five years old. And my father, he had just started to get religious. So people used to come over and he would open up the topic of deen. And I would listen. Nobody would notice me there, this little skinny 
tiny kid sitting there deep in the couch. And I'll just be listening. And one day I hear my father saying, when you go to the toilet, you shouldn't talk. Like it's not good to talk in the toilet. Um, next day, little Bilal, five years old, goes to the toilet. <laughs> and my father calls me and I didn't respond. <laughs> my mum calls me. So um, they didn't wait. I'm only five years old. Why isn't he responding? It's the first time it's ever happened. So they go to the neighbours. I'm not there. My father gets hysterical. My mother starts to raise her voice. You know, it's all within a few minutes. Little Bilal comes out. And I'm right in front of him. I'm coming out of the house. And he's like at the neighbours. He rushes to me and says, where were you? So I was in the bathroom. And he goes, why didn't you answer me? What's wrong? You scared me. I'm about to call the police. Where did you go? And I said, didn't you say yesterday that it's hard on to talk in the toilet? <laughs> of course, not hard on, but it's just, that's what I understood as a child. Instead, wallahi, he carried me, started making round the, round the world twists with me. And he laughed and says, wallahi, you're right. That is true. I did say that. Like, Allah, like, may Allah make you righteous. I still remember it till today. But do you understand having righteous company, talking about it? Isn't that better than always talking about rubbish in front of our children? All they grow up and that's what they learn. So let us, inshallah, know that they are an amana and that they will benefit us after we die, inshallah ta'ala. And lastly, um, we can also donate and do charity on behalf of our loved ones who have passed away. That'll be an ongoing legacy for them. Let's say your parents and your loved ones or brother and sister, or a husband, or a wife, or a child passed away before you. And you want to leave for them a legacy because they didn't leave a legacy of goodness. You can share in that. Donate towards a well, for example, if you're able to afford it. Give a charity on their behalf. If they haven't done hajj, do the hajj on their behalf, so long as you've done your hajj first. You're not allowed to do a hajj on behalf of someone else until you've done your hajj first. Um, and there was a man, uh, Aisha, sorry, Aisha radiallahu anha, she said that a man came to the Prophet sallallahu and said to him, Ya Rasulullah, my mother passed away and I know that if she were to be alive right now and she wanted to do any good deed, she would give charity. Ya Rasulullah, if I gave charity on her behalf, knowing that she would have loved to do that, will that count for her as if she was alive? And the Prophet sallallahu said, yes. The hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. Another man said, Ya Rasulullah, my mother passed away, and can I give charity on her behalf? And he said, yes, and, and go and like, give it in towards water, because water was in need, and water continues to, to, to flow a lot. So any kind of charity on behalf of people, inshallah, can benefit them. So my brothers and sisters, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who gives us the strength and accepts from us our good deeds, forgives us our bad deeds, and to forgive whatever we've left behind of wrong, those that we know and those we don't know. Some people, they say to me, what if there are bad deeds that I can't remember? How do I ask Allah to forgive me? We say what the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh Allah, forgive me of sins of the past which I remember, and those I didn't remember, those I did by mistake or forgetfulness, and those which I did out of ignorance, and those which I did deliberately and knew, forgive me for them. And Allah ﷻ forgives. And to count for our deeds to be a legacy for us, an ongoing knowledge or charity or righteous children who we leave behind. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Jazakumullah khair for listening. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.